think we can probably start there now. I think we've given it given it enough time for, for people to join. Um, so, once again, I'll just say welcome. Thank you very much for joining today's webinar. Um, I'll just introduce myself. So, my name is Faisal Iftikhar. I'm the Global Head of Automation at Cyclum. Um, I've been involved in delivering transformational programs for organizations for about 15 years now, um, predominantly focusing on automation over the last five years. So I've got extensive experience across a number of different industries, helping organizations scale their automation programs. Um, I've also actually got practical experience myself as well. So I was working for a large telco um, and started off their automation journey about five years ago. So I've got some practical hands-on experience as well. And I'm delighted to be joined by Kieran as well. So Kieran, what uh, do yourself? I'll do my best, Faisal. Look, good to meet everyone today. And thank you so much for taking time to come and talk to us. And please, as Faisal says, get engaged and get involved as much as possible. This is about you and your learning, not necessarily about the two of us. Uh, Faisal and I have known each other for years. As I'm saying, a really key part of this industry is to have spent time in it and to really have got your hands dirty. So I'm an automation and digital transformation expert. For the past 25 years, I've been driving business transformation across a range of industries using digital technology, intelligent automation, data analytics, as mentioning in the book, and robotic process automation. I've generated millions of dollars of value for the companies that I've worked in. But today, just to be clear, I'm a global automation lead, but these are my personal views, not those of my employer. This is my experience. And again, as Faisal says, you may agree or disagree with it. The beautiful thing about this industry is there's no one way to get it right. So I look forward to having a, a fantastic chat with Faisal and everyone else today. Fantastic. And the core objectives for today are we want you to walk away with some with some top tips, some learnings and also just some insights that you shared amongst your, your colleagues and peers as well. So really important that we get the most out of this hour. So just very quickly, just cover off the agenda point. So we'll do a very, very quick introduction to automation. So we're conscious that people will be at different stages of their automation journeys. Some may not have even started and are thinking about it and some are quite a few years in now and thinking about what, what comes next. So we'll do a quick level set around automation. We'll then talk a little bit about some market trends and some key, key data points within there. We'll talk about you know, how to get started and how to drive a scaled program. So you probably see this quite a lot in the RPA space is how do you drive scale within an organization? What we will then do is talk about our learnings between Kieran and I. So once again, you know, there isn't a one size fits all, but we will talk about what our top 10 learnings are from delivering automation at scale over the last kind of five or six years. Um, once again, we'll invite you to, to be as engaging as possible during that debate. And then we'll, we'll have some time at the end for Q&A. But as Kieran and I keep saying, please, please do engage with us throughout this session. So let's You're start. If you and I had to talk to ourselves for an hour, Faisal, and I think on that learnings, I think if we're with, if we're honest with our audience, and I think you and I are only know how to do that, we'll talk about all the things that have went wrong to yes. get those learnings and those very, painful pieces as well. Very, very important because it, it, that's that's where you learn the most from. All right, let's just quickly get onto the introduction to automation. So, I'll just cover the ro robotic process automation. So, so RPA is just kind of have had exponential growth over the last five years. A lot of hype, loads of white papers have been written about it, but what is it exactly? So it's software that emulates rule-based repetitive human keystrokes. So any processes that follow rules, uh, logic, um, are mundane, are heavy volume, can be automated by this software. Now, if you think of any organization, they will always have these kinds of processes that don't require too much thought, are just kind of repetitive and mundane. Now, the beauty of RPA is that it's a non-invasive technology. It acts on the presentation layer, so it acts as a human. So the best way to see it is it's more of a virtual worker um, rather than what we've seen before in the past, which are kind of scripts and macros, uh, which are kind of quite uncontrolled and ungoverned kind of automation. So this is very, very much a drive towards a digital workforce. So that's RPA. And intelligent automation, uh, an extension of RPA to some extent, Faisal, which is intelligent automation is RPA plus other digital toolings. So you'll have heard the phrase artificial intelligence, you'll have seen digital technology. But when we say that, what do we mean? And we're talking about a, a digital toolkit. So you might have Python in there, 
You might have optical character recognition. You might actually have Excel and VBA in there. Every bar uses that. You might have business process management software, NLP. You might have chatbots or machine learning. So intelligent automation is RPA plus other bits. And when you think about it in a workspace, RPA does what I call the clickety click. So folks are on screens, pressing buttons. Intelligent automation is the, the thinkity think, in other words, the cognitive bit. And as employees in, in organizations, we do both. We do the practical and we do the thinking. RPA is clickety click. Intelligent automation is thinkity think is a phrase. And there's a lot of different phrases that uh, that talk too about many. the market as well. There's, there's probably a little bit too many. So you may have heard hyper automation, integrated automation, but it is effective. There's also intelligent workflows as well now, but effectively what it is, is using holistic tools to, to automate processes end to end. Now, why is automation so, so prevalent in the market at the moment? So multiple benefits and, and, and it's not limited to these. So, you know, from a financial savings perspective, of course, you're going to get a lot of efficiency within organizations, but also there's going to be opportunities to, to generate revenue as well by freeing up capacity and, and focusing on more value added activity from a productivity perspective. These, these automation softwares, they, they work 24 seven um, and they're, they're very quick as well. So productivity goes up around those processing um, and from an accuracy perspective as well, you know, robots get things right first time. So if you think of those processes that have high data, highly repetitive, very mundane, they will be susceptible to, to the error. Um, these robots will get things right first time. Yeah. And as you say, Faisal, they're, they're not the only things. I love the one about financial incomes, not just savings as well. Sometimes that's forgotten. But to your point around accuracy, robots do what they're trained to do. They don't do anything different. They don't go off kilter. They don't forget. So if you've got processes that require high compliance, then put your robots toward those because they will get it right every single time at speed, at pace. Now, again, if you code the robot wrong, they'll get it wrong pretty fast. But in general, with a little bit of care, the robots will do everything they're trained to do. The scalability bit is key here for robotic process automation and intelligent automation to hire people, to train them, to coach, to mentor, to fix mistakes and whatever else takes some time. With robots and intelligent automation software, you can hire one robot, you can train it. The same training or code can be applicable to two, three, four, five, six, ten, 10, or 100 robots. So all of a sudden, you can scale your activity up really, really quickly. In addition, if market conditions uh, differ and you need to scale down, then you don't have all of the, the HR and all of the pain of removing people from your workforce. You can scale up, you can scale down, and you can do all this at speed. So we talk about robots being highly productive. You Robots are, and there's, there's different measures. You know, Some quote 15 times faster than a person, some quote three. I'm more on the three end to build yourself a bit of space. But there is no industry specs or standards in this. It does depend on your IT kit, your environment, how things uh, quickly or slowly can get processed. But robots are, are speedy. And that speed isn't just about, you know, the robots going fast or being productive. That's also about to implement a program using RPA certainly can be done a heck of a lot faster than if you were to uh, build in a huge enterprise resource platform program or if you were to code. So one of the features of this space is the ability to roll out and gain benefits really, really quickly. And hopefully we'll get talking about those today as well in a little bit more detail. Fantastic. And what we wanted to just say as well was, you know, this is your automation journey and it's an intelligent automation journey and this is gonna continuously evolve. Um, we're, we're big believers of that RPA is the foundation of that journey. It, it's a great place to start. There's a lot of benefits to be had there. So the way we're going to focus today's session on is talking a lot about RPA, but also then talking about how do you overcome the hurdles and, and getting towards intelligent automation. But before we really get into it, we just wanted to do a quick poll just to find out, just to do a bit of level set, see where people are. Has your organization started its RPA journey? So you will just see there's a, there's, there's a poll that's just popped up on your right hand side. So if everybody could just partake in that, just to say whether you have started it or you haven't started it, and that will give us a, a good idea to see where people are right now. Okay, we'll just give a couple of minutes. It's quite an interesting mix looking at the stats it's a already. Very interesting mix, yeah. Almost half and half. Oh, oh, oh! Now, now we're getting a lot more yeses. <laughs> it started off fifty-fifty. Now we've got a, uh, a sixty-three thirty-eight. So it's not, it's not totally the hundred percent. Oh, now, now, now we're back to the fifty-nine forty-one, which is 
which is it's a bit uh, like an exciting horse race, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so this is interesting, right? So, so we've got almost forty percent that that haven't started uh, haven't started RPA at all, and then you've got sixty percent that, that that have done something. So it's around the sixty forty mark. We've got a couple of stats, and, and and this will be kind of an interesting precursor to to the conversation and dialogue we're going to have. So there's a couple of trends here that we want to talk about. So ninety eight, this ninety eight represents. 98% of senior executives, senior IT executives, believe that RPA will play a core role in their business efficiency programs. Now, Kieran, what's your perspective on that? Yeah, it's interesting, Faisal, because again, if we look at the poll here, um, despite it being 60-40, we've 100% of people on the poll who actually have come across RPA. And when you look at this sector, it's the fastest growing sector for the last couple of years in terms of IT spend. And there's a reason for that, and that is literally the benefits that you can get out of it. Now, it's not easy to do, and it's not hard to do either. Somewhere in between, I think, is the answer. But it, it doesn't surprise me because there's been so much motion and compo commotion around the sector. But I think that's down to the benefits it can offer more than anything else. And therefore, it's good to see. 98 feels a little bit big. But again, these are, these are um, you know, it's a very competitive space. There's some fantastic global brands have entered this space. And if you really think about it, the space has grown from roughly 2001 to now. Now, that's not 15, 18 years. And for a sector to be suddenly global and so well known, it's an exciting space to be. And there has to be reasons why that is the case. Hasn't gone away, hasn't been forgotten. The benefits are there. And hopefully, the goodness will we'll help folks understand those today. I, I'd yeah. be more on 70, 80, but I, I like the fact it's it's 98, 100. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and the way it's grown as well. So when the same survey was done three years ago, it was around a 72% mark. So you can yeah. see it, it, it's definitely hitting the agendas for, for most organizations. Just some other interesting stats here as well. So we just kind of call these out. So 55. So 55 represents a, a survey that was done by Gartner, which said 55% of organizations have started their, their journey with RPA. And that's pretty similar to the, to the poll that we've just done there. We've got 60, 40 here. So that's, that's pretty accurate. But probably the most interesting stat that came out of that survey was the number 13. 13% represent the number of organizations that have scaled their programs. And when we talk about scale, we're talking about the number of processes. So the number that's usually used for scale is about 50 or more. And we also talk about it being scaled across your whole enterprise rather than it just being within one function. Um, now, this is a stat that's kind of making its way around the industry and people are talking quite a bit about scaling. So we'll talk about that in a lot more detail later on. But Kieran, what's your initial thoughts around those those statistics? Yeah, well, if we look at what folks have filled in today, then um, at the 55 and the 60 go really well together. So it's hard to argue with facts. Uh, the 13 percent is interesting around scaling because I think that's one of those most tremendous debates that we've had, had out there in this space for years. It used to be 50 robots equal success or not. And that was always one I, I never truly liked because if we had 50 people sitting in a business, Faisal, and they were doing very little or not adding any real value, I don't think we'd be shouting to our business colleagues about how successful we were. And therefore, there is no one one set measure because I've had robots, you know, two robots delivering, uh, you know, just under $5 million of revenue over two years. So is that scale? You know, I, I'm pretty happy with that in that instance. But I like your definition there, which is, you know, robotic robotic process automation is rolled out across, you know, most, if not all, organizational units. They're deriving value from it. And that's the key bit. It's not just put in doing things that are shaving off, you know, moments of time. You have to develop real value from your automation program. And we'll be talking about that in a little bit about, you know, what is key and key is getting your finance person wrapped around whatever it is you're doing before you begin the program you work out what are those returns that you're going to get and those are the returns that hit your PL that really do count in terms of when you're looking your cfo in the eye so scaling has to be related no matter what the measure you use with discernible value coming out of your program and that's key lots of programs have failed because people have started and forgot or or neglected to generate real incomes, real savings, or real something else that a CFO could look at. Faisal, is that fair? That's ab absolutely, absolutely. And we'll talk a little bit more in detail about that, especially when we come on to learnings. And then just, just as the final two very quick statistics, so we've got the 12 and the six. The 12 represents 
the typical payback period for a robotic process automation program. So 12 months is the kind of the, the industry standard. We've seen programs all the way kind of, you know, some are even less than that. So there is fantastic returns to be had with RPA. Um, and the six represents, it can sometimes take just six weeks to get a process automated as part of a proof of value, purely, purely dependent on kind of complexity that you may have within an organization. But Kieran, would you like to kind of build on those, build on those stats? Yeah, the 12 months, I, I, I've actually seen uh, lots of different ends in that, Faisal, and therefore it's different per organization. 12 months, certainly more, more than achievable, and as you say, often a little bit less. Picking the right process at the beginning, that's tremendous value out of it. You know, there you can get your returns pretty quickly and build momentum and a bit of faith in your organization, because that's key, being able to show people that the faith they've put in you to invest in this program gets its payback. I've also seen, you know, programs that can take 18 months and beyond to get value. And that's sometimes organizations literally need to look at the value they're going to create over what time period. It goes back to that business uh, business plan. And therefore, sometimes they just have to be that little bit more patient because transformation does take time. And if they allow, are allowing themselves to be that little bit more patient, then the benefits can be tremendous. So it's not, it's different times for different organizations. Uh, so therefore, don't don't just stick to the stat in itself. Six weeks, more than doable, Faisal. Absolutely. You know, chuck a, a robot PC up in the desk, choose a process and get going. That's one of the key messages that we would be uh, talking about or, or I would promote. You know, that start small, think big and move fast initiative. Again, it comes down to picking the right process. And if we look, and I know we're going to talk about this a little bit later on, we keep teasing people about what we're going to talk about. Yeah. We, we'll have to go into it. But when you're doing your, your your POC and POV, and we'll talk about that in a moment and the differences, you know, choose the right process, but test as well. You know, it's an opportunity to really see if automation works in your organization or which tooling. It's an opportunity to try different things like design thinking, rollout agile, you know, explain the benefits of RPA and lots of other things. But six weeks, highly doable to get yourself started to get a to get an understanding of what's the art of the possible fantastic and just once again opening this up to to all the participants feel free once again in the chat to, are the any of these stats surprising uh, would you like to challenge any of these stats what's your experience as well of, of kind of delivering those that's 60 percent that have actually trialed or have done rpa if you could kind of share some of your viewpoints that would be fantastic as well just before we kind of move on to the next piece, another poll. For those that have started their journeys, how many of you have scaled your programs? So if you just go to the polls, there's, a, there's, there's another poll there for everybody to, to, to participate in. I like Anthony's chat question there. The stats are encouraging. Less than a year's payback is excellent. Yeah, absolutely, Anthony. You picked the right processes right from the very beginning. You can get your your payback pretty darn quick. It does come down to choosing the right things to automate. Absolutely, absolutely. But there are so I think when 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 it just started off, you know, five years ago, a lot of the large financial institutions um, automated a number of their kind of remediation processes, onboarding processes, um, credit checking processes, where they had armies of people doing that. So there were some really good benefits to be had. Um, so the first couple of years, there were just some really positive stories coming out about RPA. Over the last few years, we have been seeing some uh, quite a few stories out, out there where people aren't seeing those kind of 12 month payback periods. So what we will be talking about is really selecting those right processes and getting the right foundations in place. 100%. So just to quickly look at the polls again. Um, we've got only 7% have said that we scaled, Kieran. So you know, that 13% that stats, really interesting. You know, 60% of people, participants here have actually started their program, but, you know, only 7% of, of participants today have actually scaled. So, so we'll, we'll talk through some frameworks that should help you um, think about your journey and some learnings as well. Yeah. And it is an early, it's an early-ish technology now that it's settled down a little bit, Faisal. I would go back to those five, six, seven years ago, very much at the start of this technology. Now it's got a little bit more mature now the industry knowledge out there is is starting to get a lot better so i think we'll see that seven and that 13 percent going up but it is about education learning that little bit more jumping in and trying these things but it's interesting to see the 40 percent that started the scale as well which just shows you how how far on this technology has come absolutely absolutely 
And and just just saying that scale, that 13%, once again, it is on the upward trajectory. Last year's stat was around 8 9%. So it is, it, it is on its way up. So it'd be interesting to see what we've got towards the end of this year. Right. So what do we mean by driving scale then? Um, we're going to just quickly walk you through a framework. Now, this isn't a one-size-fits-all framework. So this is a framework that's worked quite well for Kieran and I when we've been delivering automation at scale for across organizations. So we'll just quickly talk you through this, this framework, which is quite, quite straightforward. But we'll, we always say that when you're starting off your journey, always start with a proof of value um, because this really helps you demonstrate what the value of RPA is. It helps you demonstrate that it works within your organization. But not only that, it also helps you get engagement and buy-in within the organization. Now, there's a lot of organizations that feel like we don't need to do a POC or a POV. We can just jump straight in. Um, but we always say, do one of these first because it really helps you drive the value and prove that this technology works. Now, Kieran, if you were to kind of give some top three tips to people that haven't started this, what would you say around POVs? What, what, what should they get right? Yeah, I, I think it goes back to what we said a couple of times, and there's a thread of logic to our conversations in each of the pages. So that that first process has to be really good. And later on, let me tell you about my first process that, that <laughs> let's be honest, you, you know the story, Faisal, it, it wasn't particularly good. I learned a lot from it. Ideally, we would have done it right first time, but selecting the right process is key. There's enough industry knowledge out there. There's heat maps out there to say where you should begin. And I think to what you're saying there is it's get the process right, do a lot of communication in your organization, you know, enough not to get people too excited so that they expect far too much of the program, but get that buy-in from the business, You know, particularly an executive who will sponsor and support this. Remember to engage your IT team in there and get their buy-in. Don't run, uh, run solo on this because there's so many dependencies on those folks and your InfoSec team or your security team plus your risk, plus your compliance team. And the other bit is if you can, not only pick the right process, get the buy-in from all those groups, manage your communication lesson really well and keep people informed and interested in what you're doing, but pick a process that you can get some value from. And once you've done the value from the process, I think one of the things you and I've done in the past, Faisal, is we videoed it. We've got the person and the team who benefited from the, the lesson itself to talk about the automation benefits in their words to the audience. And then we've used that video in town halls and in presentations. We've put it on our intranet or SharePoint sites. Other tools are available, of course, but we've really spent a lot of time communicating with the business in the words of the business themselves. The SME piece on getting them engaged, getting them involved earlier on, and letting them talk to the benefits is absolutely key at that very, very first stage. Fantastic. We just had a fantastic question that's just come in as well. How do you choose which is the right process to start with? Uh, the one with the highest value or the easiest, the cheapest one to do? So I was going to actually ask you this. I was going to ask you this question anyway, Kieran. Would you would you go for a more complex process or do you go for a more simple process when you're starting off with? <laughs> you, the... you see tears in my eyes from the very first time I, I tried this. We picked something to meeting. Yeah. We really did. We went after a consolidating report, which was uh, multiple different locations, geographies, different systems, different applications, whatever else. And what was meant to take eight weeks ended up taking 14. And we just about managed to get it over the line. Horrible experience, if truth yeah. be told, for the very first process. But by God, did we learn so much day one. And what I would do is if you've got it depends on the amount of time you have and, and it depends on how much pressure you're under in a business to prove benefit. So let's say you have six to eight weeks to do something. That, that isn't the crazy amount of time. I'm going to assume you've picked the pro, the right process first. And by that, you can go to any of the vendors, go to Faisal, go online, and you will see heat maps that show where things will work. If you go around and you get yourself maybe 10 processes right at the very beginning, because you do need a pipeline, some things organizations forget to do is they get that one small initial process enough to challenge the software, enough to get the team to learn, enough to get you to try different things like design thinking, like agile or DevOps, just you know, enough, enough meat on that to make it interesting and to challenge the software in yourself, not too big either, so that you, you will fail because if all eyes are on this program, you're gonna be in trouble. But let's assume you have six to eight weeks, you choose a process at the right size, it adds an amount of value, but you manage expectations to the organization as well. So it's not going to suddenly deliver $90 million just as, as, a, as an interesting piece. You know, that 
easier scale, smaller process, something that is a challenge for the business is an interesting, yeah. but isn't so big to be frightening. But you do get to test the toy and you do get to try all those other things around it. And your team learns and your SMEs engaged and they feel involved. And at the end, they feel they've had some element of value, not just having done it for a bit of fun, but get the other processes lined up as well. So there's momentum built around your program. Because if you do it right, you get some value, you get a lot of interest and attention. The key bit is to maintain it and therefore don't make the mistakes of lots of organizations to not have process number two, three, four, five, and six in your backlog. Uh, you, what you will hear, maybe, and again, Faisal, interest in your view, get the processes right and the selection of those good, standard, repeatable, data, small sequence, logical processes from day one, right? And everything else falls into place. Yeah, absolutely. Just, 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 just to build on that, so three things I would say, just to echo Kieran's point. So first thing is don't pick a very complex process because if you get it wrong to start off with, it, it could potentially delay your whole journey and your whole program. And in some cases, it has even collapsed programs altogether. Um, second thing I would say is pick a process which is actually seen as a bit of a pain point in the organization. So by automating that process, people then immediately buy into it um, and they see the value. And then finally, make sure you pick a process which hits one of your kind of benefit drivers. Now, the benefit drivers might not be around efficiency. Think of it more from a balanced scorecard perspective. It could be around compliance. It could be around process performance. It could be around kind of improving customer satisfaction. Um, it could be around even improving your employees' job roles, you know, freeing them up to do more, more value-added tasks. So think about what the value driver is um, and that you can quantify it and measure it so that once you do deliver the proof of value, you know how much value has been delivered by automating that process. Okay, so that's the proof of value. Once you've got that up and running and it's working and you've demonstrated that, 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 that RPA has, has a place in your organization, we always then say, do your strategy and operating model piece. Now, you could do this before, but we always say, you know, once you've proven the value, if you're gonna scale this, what is your vision for automation? What's your strategic roadmap? What's your three-year strategy? What's your five-year strategy? Um, how are you going to deliver this? What's the operating model that's going to underpin your strategy? Where is your COE going to sit? All of this is absolutely essential to build the foundations for driving a scaled, a scaled program. So um, a lot of organizations forget to do this and they just jump into right we've done a proof of value now let's jump into the next couple of processes immediately well, that could be a slight delay there Feist. we hear you though <laughs> sorry sorry can you hear me sorry kieran can you hear me sorry Faisal, slight delay on my internet there that's the joy of being home broadband oh can you can, can everybody else hear me is it just is it just me? Oh, they can't hear. No, that's fine. It's just, it's just yourself, Kieran. <laughs> okay, everyone's everyone's replying back, but they can't hear me. So, this piece is for me is the most important part of any RPA journey. So, if anybody ever asks me what's the thing that I need to get right, for me, it's all about get this get your strategy and operating model in place because that will then enable you to scale. Now, once you've done that kind of strategy and operating model, we then say go and do your process discovery. So as Kieran was saying, you know, make sure that you've got a backlog of what's the next few processes after your proof of value. When we say do your process discovery. Sorry, if we, a bit of, yeah, my broadband suddenly disappeared there for some reason, Faisal, don't know why. Right, okay, you're, but you're back though, that's fine. Everybody could hear. We say when you're doing your process discovery, uh, do it ah, in one joy. function to demonstrate the value, prove the blueprint, uh, build the backlog, build the business case, and then you can then move on to number four, which is you then actually go and deliver and build capability. And when we say deliver and build capability, what we mean is actually build the bots, but also build your internal capability, become self-sufficient. Um, it's really important that when you're creating your center or centers of excellence, that you build your internal capability because you're going to be building these processes at scale, uh, but you're also going to be managing them <laughs> as well. Um, and then finally, uh, once you've actually done this kind of build, you've done the build, building the capability, you've done it within one function, um, you can then kind of go and repeat that for other functions as well, because you've got the blueprint, you've got the center of excellence, um, and, and then you can kind of then move on to what we'd like to call the, the, the intelligent automation piece. So once you've done a number of different functions, you can then start thinking about, okay, 
what other tools and technology can I combine with my RPA to, to information, whether it's virtual assistants, whether it's OCR, whether it's the kind of Python tools, whether it's the workflow tools, et cetera, to kind of really drive out your automation program. So I just see Kieran's, um, Kieran's uh, just, uh, just, just having to dial out, he's having broadband issues. We did have a couple of questions that came through as well, as I was noticing. So uh, what type of compliance issues do you usually have with your chat for when in place? Okay, we'll, we'll come on to that in a little bit when we talk about the learnings. Be interested to understand how you'd pick the right process. Is it recommended to use people or technology or a combined approach and why? So yes, yeah, so when you, when you are picking the, the process, um, the best way to do it would be, as I mentioned, kind of almost have a balanced scorecard to start off with to say, what's the what's the business driver for automating what's the business driver for for driving automation within your organization and it could be a balanced scorecard of opportunities now whether it's whether it's process efficiency whether it's process performance whether it's process compliance whether it's customer um whether it's just purely purely financial i would kind of build that balanced scorecard out and then when you're looking at processes you score those processes against each of those um, dimensions or metrics that you've that you've pulled together. Kieran, have we got you back? We have. I, we I have, think and you can hear us as well. playing with the broadband again. No worries. Um, and then when you're looking at those processes, you do have to then look at you know what applications are you touching, what people are being impacted. So it is very much a combined approach, but you're letting it be driven by the business drivers. What's the value that's being created? So. Uh, by having that approach to start off with, that's what's going to help you select your process. And then once you look at your process, you can then determine how complex is the process, you know, by looking at how many applications does it touch, how many screens does it touch, how many handoffs does it have, how many business steps are there. By having those different, um, different logic builds put in and all of the different criteria, that then enables you to determine, you know, how complex is this process. And then you can prioritize it based on value and complexity. So just answering the question, Kieran, there on, you know, how would you pick the right process? Yeah. Um, just really focusing in on the, on, on the value piece. Um, there's a question there around which RPA technology you use to do automation. So we've, we've, used all of the, we've used all of the RPA technologies. In fact, so, you know, you've got the, you've, you've got the top three players. You've got Automation Anywhere, UiPath, Blue Prism. They're all fantastic tools. Um, we're probably not going to go into too much detail around what's the right tool to select. Um, in this, in this, but it's it's up to each an individual organisation to select the select the right tool for them. Yeah, I think that's a key one, Faisal, because not every tool will work with every every application or organisation, and therefore, again, I've seen organisations maybe testing you know, one, two, or three tools during their their proof of value or proof of concept. There are lists out there you can go onto the internet, or you can get consulting advice that helps you find the right tool for your organisation, because it's one of those things find the right process, find the right tooling, and then you're on a, on a very successful journey. Yep. I see there's a, a couple of questions in there. There's, just there's a very up. good question around where to start, right? So very good one. I'll take this one first, and then Kieran, you can go next. But, you know, for me, RPA, you can drive, um, you can drive value in absolutely any single, isn't any single business function because you are going to find processes that, that drive value. But if, if anybody ever asks me, where's the right place to start? I always say within your back office, you've got, finance, HR, IT, procurement, any of those functions will always have these rule-based repetitive processes that are crying out to be automated. Um, finance particularly, you know, that's where a lot of organizations particularly start their journeys. And I know, Kieran, that's where we started one of our journeys together as well, right? Was, was within Absolutely. Finance. Absolutely. I think there's loads, you know, again, as you say, any of those repetitive processes, claims, departments, and, and, and. The other bit is, though, remember, folks, if you've intelligent automating tooling, then you can start to look to the front office as well. So particularly contact centers, I see a lot of those with a lot of digital tools, including RPA been involved there as well. You know, you start to look at chatbots taking and data robots take the data in and out of those and look back, look up back end systems. You start to see smart web forms as well that integrate into the back office as well with robots again, taking the data and moving them around the place. Any of the vendors will have a, a lot of heat maps where you can go when they have already over the last six, eight years worked out, you know, what's hot to trot as it were. In other words, really good areas to, to go for automation. That's front, back and middle office. 
and then you'll see the areas that are less likely but it doesn't mean you can't improve them through some element of leaning or design thinking or some element of automation as well but always pick those functions that you know there's a lot of opportunity because yeah. it's that first function you need to get that right and then that helps as it acts as a catalyst for other other functions and so that just, goes to Anthony's point about getting a return out of the business. You know, go for the stuff that will add value right at the very start to evidence the value in the program. The more, and again, it's like every modern organization these days, the areas that are proving their value first tend to get more of the attention, which means cash in most places. Yeah. So got some really, really other good, good, good points coming through as well. So uh, a bit Ooh. more around defining what point two is, you know, what's the strategy and operating model, a bit of guidance, and what do we, what do you mean and how do you do it? So the strategy and operating model effectively is, the way you've got to look at it is defining, you know, what's your business case over the next three years going to be? What's your value case? What's your roadmap? And then what's your operating model underpinning that strategy? And what we mean by operating model is, you know, are you going to have a center of excellence that's going to drive this automation program for you? What's going to be the structure of that center of excellence? Is it going to be a centralized model? Is it going to be a, a hybrid hub and spoke model? What are then the um, frameworks that you're going to follow that's going to enable you to drive automation at scale? So all of your governance frameworks, how you're going to do process identification, how you're going to build bots, how you're going to maintain bots. So make sure that you get all of those standards in place before you do this in anger effectively. So it's really important to get the foundation. So the way I would see number two is you're getting set up for success effectively. I, I think on Cecily's point there as well, and hopefully I'm pronouncing your name right, if I'm not, my apologies. Uh, the other bit is remember automation isn't a strategy, if that makes sense. Automation is the tooling you need to go and talk to your, your business leaders and say, look, where is it that we want to be in one, two, and three years' time? And they'll probably use words like, you know, we want to go be more digital, we want to be more automated, whatever else. This is the tooling that allows them to help deliver the strategy. So when you say strategy, go and talk to your CEO, go and talk to your business leaders and say, look, where does the organization want to be? And hopefully you can actually influence that strategy as well by introducing mm -hmm. all of these new toolings, this new digital way of working and this new automa automated way of working as well. Uh, Niraj has come up with a brilliant point there. Is it yeah, very good. to secure mindset for automation? Yes. Oh my goodness, Niraj. That's, yep. that's an amazing question. The that's answer probably is- probably the most important one, I think. Oh God, there's too many important ones, I think, as this is the <laughs> interesting challenges. Yes, absolutely. We've seen too many organizations who are siloed. In other words, they won't share information across different domains, functions, yeah. geographies, makes it difficult to scale or do anything. And sometimes, and I would almost recommend this in many regards, you know, do a program, build a bit of faith, sell the vision, sell the program, because sometimes it's just folks don't know what they don't know and therefore help them. If it is intransigence where they will not change their mindset, you might be better just putting a hold on your automation program until it's ready. But do remember, you have an obligation to show the organization the art of the possible. Just don't expect them yeah. because you know what, what is possible that they will. So spend a lot of time going back during that POV and even on the lead up to it, communicating the value of the tooling, how it might work, how it might benefit the organization, how it will help deliver the strategy. And then do not forget when you're delivering a successful program, if you do anything, communicate, communicate, communicate the value to keep everybody's mindset focused on, on this area and this this uh, tool for transformation. Absolutely. This is, this is, this is a massive, massive thing, Neeraj. So you need to make sure that you've got the culture in place if you're going to do this at scale, because without that, without buy-in, um, from the organization, you're going to really struggle to, to kind of get that engagement um, and identify further, further processes. And that's why we think that proof of value almost acts as a, yes, it, it, it does it, it does what it says on the tin. It, it proves the technology, right? And it proves that you can automate processes, but it definitely does a bit more than that. It helps you with the mindset shift as well. Something that Kieran was saying earlier, which is, you know, use that proof of value to, to really change the mindset within your organization and what i always say about any of these kind of rpa programs is people just see this as a as a, as a technology implementation it's kind of not i'd, I'd actually say that de the development's only 30 percent of it this really really is a a business change a, a pure transformation program so it requires all of that that cultural and mindset change as well it's a really good question neeraj and get get uh, one of the board, by the way, or one of the executive team behind it, Niraj. You know, if you have executive sponsorship, that really helps. If people see there's an executive wants it, it's a top five agenda item. 
their their will, their support, you know, her support for you could be absolutely immense and amazing to help change mindset. Yeah, okay. Very quickly, just in the interest of time, Kira, we've just got a couple more questions. So Agile in, in, in RPA? 100%, go for it. Literally, this is a fast technology. It's not like your usual, you know, C-sharp Python coding where you need to spend a lot of time doing a waterfall methodology. It's quick, it works. It's at the surface layer, as you mentioned. Get it in, get your Agile sprints going, and you will deliver value really quick. And just to be a little bit careful, because it's not 100% pure Agile, there, is, there are going to be elements of you know, waterfall in there. So historically, Agile. when it just started, Agile. if we're not going to use that word, we're not going to use that word. <laughs> but historically, when RPA did start, it was predicated on, you know, kind of waterfall, te- waterfall uh, methods. Uh, but now we are seeing that transition to much, much more Agile methods. Um, so yes, it's, it's definitely driving towards that. Starting to see DevOps in there as well. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so, so so that's you know once once again just just to kind of recap here on this, where do you start and drive this scaled scaled program? This isn't a one size fits all. Uh, this is something that you know for Kieran and I, it's worked well. Some people do the strategy and operating model way before they even go and commence the proof of value. But the key thing here is it's iterative. So keep looking at it. You know, once you've done a year of it, revisit your strategy, revisit your operating model. And what Kieran said as well was, how does this how does automation play into your wider organization strategy? Really important to kind of feed that in. Okay. In the interest cool. of time, we've got, some, we've got some learnings to talk through here as well. And once again, keep, keep adding questions in and keep building on your learnings as well. It would be really, really good to, to kind of hear from you as well. So, Kieran, you, you can make a start. Yeah, buy-in and sponsorship, absolutely key. The thing I see in organizations, when there's too many key strategic objectives, uh, it's a, it's there's too much. You know, if organization is getting the message that everything is key, then nothing is key. I've seen really good organizations. There's no fixed number in this, but there's five key objectives for the entire organization. That's the business strategy has been set. The five key objectives are going to deliver that. If you have got uh, automation and digitization and transformation is one of those. You've got an executive sponsor. All of these um, goals are built into KPIs and everything else and department goals. Everybody's talking about it at senior level. When you've that buy-in, trust me, this this can be amazing. It, it goes back to Niraj's point about mindset. Everybody knows and believes it's important, and this can accelerate really at pace. Great. Operating model. So very important piece. I mentioned this before as well. People don't get the operating model right. People don't set up their centers of excellence right, or they don't set them up for success. This for me is so, so key because this then acts as the catalyst for, for scaling, getting that center of excellence, um, deciding on, you know, what's the kind of structure that you want in your center of excellence? What's the size of team that you want? Um, how many, you know, are you going to build your own capability? Is it going to be a centralized model? Is it going to be a hub and spoke model? What are the frameworks that are going to underpin it? This is so, so important um, and a key ingredient to, to driving to driving scale. And a lot of organizations don't put enough time into that. Yeah. Vision and expectation. We mentioned that just on the last slide that we talked about strategy and operating model and everything else. But understand the journey you're going on. If we get in a car on a Saturday morning and we go on a journey, we can end up in amazing places. But very often we don't. Therefore, if you map where you want to go, and that mapping has to be a, in a, a, a direct alignment with the strategy of the organization, and you paint a picture of how RPA and intelligent automation and digitization can get you there, and you understand what to expect, that journey is, is a heck of a lot more satisfying, a heck of a lot uh, straighter, and you're more likely to get the returns out of it. Process identification. So pick the right process. The number of situations we've had where the wrong process has been picked and has then been automated and then there's no value on the back of automating that process so we've all got examples of that i think kieran shared one uh, probably <laughs> earlier on um I, i've got loads myself as well so you know there, there was a process uh, once again it was a reporting process it took about 16 weeks to, to automate a number of kind of non-standard reports that are being produced by by an accounts payable department um, those reports weren't even needed. Um, you know, they, they've been historically been generated for the last kind of three years. Uh, so just a very, very quick check around, you know, can we even stop and eliminate this process before even automating it would have removed the need to automate that process. So we've all got examples of that. I mean, please feel free to share some, some, some kind of stories as well if you want to around, you know, processes that you pick. So make sure when you're doing process identification, that you've got a very clear method in place for how you select your process, 
what are the value drivers so think about that balanced scorecard perspective think about how you um, cr evaluate the criteria for those think about the complexity of those and then how you prioritize them really important to to kind of get that process identification right to to build your backlog yep uh, business case uh, for me again rpa can deliver a balanced scorecard of of benefits we talked about risk and compliance and speed and everything else we may or may not vary on this one as well, like myself and Faisal engage in these debates all the time. I, I'm a fan of, look, if your program isn't making money, then it's failed, uh, which is very much, you need to take cost out of your business and that has to come off your P&L, or you need to add income into your business to pay for your automation program. Now you can, if for example, you have staff exiting the organization at pace and the NPS is horrendous, you can get automation in, in that instance there to improve the NPS, improve value, by showing that your recruitment costs, your higher costs, your rework costs and everything else all have been benefited on the basis of automation. But if automation, I'll make up a figure here, it's not a figure that uh, to stand over. If your automation program costs $50,000, you need to make sure you deliver in excess of $50,000 worth of value. Otherwise your CFO, when it comes to times and budgets and when times are tough, they're going to look and say, does it stack up? This is a program that can give you a multiple of value, but wrap your, finance person around this, find the things that add real value, build a business case, deliver on the business case, tell the organization you're delivering on the business mm -hmm. case and constantly check in with what you've automated still stacks up and is still delivering the benefits to make sure you are realizing real value. Delivery at speed. So multiple different components of this. This could be deliver your whole program at speed, but also deliver your automations at speed as well. So make sure that you've got the right standards in place, the right methods in place, uh, the, the right best practices in place. If you've got reusable objects, reusable code, make sure that's all in place to enable you to deliver those automations at pace. And the more mature you get with it, the more faster and the more velocity you should be building with um, building your automations. Yep. I'll answer the next one, Faisal, and then Oliver's asked a question. Maybe we answer oh, that. I'll pick that yeah. So capability is key. You know, e e automation isn't hard to get right. It's not as if you need to be a .NET developer or a C-sharp developer with multiple years experience, but you do need a level of competency in this, you know, a logical mindset for developers and business analysts. You need people who understand technology and how it can actually deliver for the Folks are going to be the evangelists of the program or the leads of the program, but it's like everything in right. I remember talking to a guy who ran a multi-billion pound company a couple of years ago. His message, his message was very, very clear, and it was a he in that particular instance, which was get the right people in the right roles, give them a plan that allows them to succeed, let them get on with it, and an A team with an A plan will deliver you an A game. So pick the right people for automation land. Not everybody can do it, and that's not a, a, a disservice to them. I can't play the piano. I never will be able to. I'll never be able to draw. I will be able to do certain other things, but get the team right as well. Right role, right person, right plan. You will deliver real value. Do you want to quickly pick up on Oliver's question as well, and then we'll move on? Do we need a maturity model? So I, I need to obviously understand this level. I, an organization has to be reasonably mature. And I need to explain that if, if processes are, if you're trying to hit a moving target, in other words, the application keeps changing, the screens keep changing, people aren't sure what they're going, where they're going to go. In other words, the strategy isn't particularly clear. You, you just can't do it. So you need a degree of maturity within an organization to make sure the processes are reasonably standard, that they're not ripping out the whole of the application that you've just built your automation program upon in the next six months. So yes, you need maturity. It'll vary per organization, department, whatever else. So yes, I think the answer to that one is um, yeah. just again, when you're checking your processes, look, are these gonna change? How often do the applications change? Get yourself built into the change management program. All those things are key. And, and I would just quickly add to that as well. So a lot of organizations always ask, you know, can I automate a broken process or do I have to wait for a process to be fully standardized before I go and automate it? The answer is you're going to, it needs to be somewhere in between. You don't want to automate a broken process because you're just going to get broken outputs. You waiting for process to be standardized, right? We've been waiting for 10, 20 years, right? Organizations talk about we're going to standardize processes and we never, ever get there. So the answer is in between use automation as that enabler to drive you towards standardized processes. So this can be then used as a catalyst to, to drive you towards standard. So we were on the managing bots. So very quickly on the, on the learnings as well. So managing bots, once you've actually put your, um, your bots into production, you need to manage them as 
as you would with human workers, you need to manage your vir virtual workforce. So you need to constantly monitor them, monitor their performance, but also optimize the bots as well. So when you do build an automation solution, you're usually just going to build the happy path. And what you then need to start looking at are what exceptions are coming out and what aut exceptions can we then automate. So it's really important to keep revisiting the automations that you've built. Yeah, 100%. That's a hidden cost very often. Faisal, some people put them in, they work, and then they forget them. You just can't. Just to your point, you manage people, you manage bots actively. Technical readiness, again, get your IT team involved, folks. You can put this on a desktop. You can download it tomorrow morning. But the IT team there are there for a reason. They'll understand the security issues. They'll understand the application changes and what's happening. Therefore, you know, go in, build a good enterprise capable, ready platform, and everything else will take care of itself because your bots and your environment will be available and everything that the bots are doing will be delivered. And then the final one is intelligent automation. So, of course, we, we, we're, we're very much predicating, you know, start your journey off with RPA, but definitely have that intelligent automation in mind. So when you are looking at processes, yes, there might be bits that RPA can do, but also start thinking about what's the next wave of technology as part of your program. Um, and that will that will be, help be defined when you're doing your process identification, when you're building your backlog, you can then identify what the next wave of technology is. So really important to do that. And um, we've got a poll straight after this, but I'll ask Kieran a quick question around, you know, why you know, organizations are kind of, there's almost kind of two stumbling blocks. One is getting started on RPA usually is, is, is one stumbling block. Cause, and then once you've started on that, you make really good progress on RPA for about three years. And then the next stumbling block is, how do we then get onto intelligent automation? So why do you think you have that yeah. second stumbling block getting into intelligent automation? Oh, there's so many reasons, Faisal. I think, um, you know, it, it, if you use RPA, you can certainly leverage a ton of benefit in a very short period of time. But you'll find you'll run out of processes that are very much clickety click. And therefore, I, I wouldn't ask organizations to make, wait three years. You know, at the beginning, I, you will see lots of things that could do with, for example, optical character recognition or smart forms. Where organizations struggle is that they run out of runway with RPA. They haven't considered the intelligent automation tooling and the art of the possible that you can suddenly extend your automation roadway with that. Therefore, I would recommend, you know, start with RPA, learn your lessons, build a scale platform, something that isn't a desktop sitting in a corner of, of a particular department or function, treat it like an enterprise platform and add on more capability as you go. People in an organization do the clickety click, but a lot of the tasks are the thinkity think, the more cognitive stuff. So where you can lean in and build skills in RPA plus OCR plus machine learning, plus AI and all those other things, even Excel, BBA, you will find that you will be able to continue to grow and scale your automation program. Keep doing all the things we're talking about today. Don't allow any of them to drop. You know, keep a focus on all these different disciplines and all these different tasks, and you will be fine. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. We all learn. Turn up at webinars, seminars, learn what you can, get the books. As we talked about earlier on, keep learning, keep growing, and you will deliver a heck of a lot of value. Fantastic. Right. Let's go on to the... There are our learnings, and what we're going to do is just do a very quick poll, another poll, just to uh, get a state of the nation. Just, just pick which one you think is the most important learning. Um, and once again, if, you do, if you've got other learnings that you want to add in, please feel free to add that into the chat. Any questions that you may have as well, please feel free to kind of fire those in as we're, as we're doing this poll. Yep. Owen's asked a question in there in the background as well. Oh, yeah, yes, yeah. So we've got so we've got two. So quick questions, some examples of intelligent automating and cognitive. Yeah, absolutely. So if you think of a, a really, really good one that you can think of, uh, you know, so Kieran just mentioned some around kind of using OCR technology with with uh, with RPA. So if you think of standard kind of invoice processing and invoice comes in, use OCR technology to kind of take the unstructured formats of data, make that structured, and then you get the RPA bot to kind of carry out the transactional and process the invoice. But also think about the, the virtual assistant ones as well, right? So if you think about kind of chatbots where they are interacting with potentially customers or even internal stakeholders, the chatbots are then making a decision to then pass over to a, an RPA bot to kind of carry out the transaction. So for example, let's think about um, in the financial services sector when somebody wants to kind of, um, they've forgotten their PIN or they want to block their card, 
they can do that via a chatbot. The chatbot then passes that decision over to an RPA bot to go and kind of carry out the transaction in the, in, in the back office system. So it's a number of different processes that you can, I mean, almost all processes, when you look at them end to end, you can kind of select which tool um, you, you can use to kind of get that touchless, that touchless processing. Yeah, interesting. The poll, I'm just looking at the stats. It's almost a third, a third, a third, Faisal. Buy in oh, wow, and okay. You know, yeah, absolutely key. I think we all agree that one. If you don't have that executive sponsorship, you're in trouble. Process identification, yeah, absolutely. Get the processes yes. right. And it's a bit like dominoes, always everything else fills, it falls in place. Vision and expectation for me personally, I would relate that very much to the business case, lining up against the strategy, the organization. And what I would encourage is wrap your program. Automation isn't a strategy. Your business strategy is what you're going to deliver to your customers and their willingness to pay money for it. Your automation and digitization program enables that journey to be brought forward into the 21st century. And if you're aligned and you're working on the right things, your business case will take care of itself. Absolutely. And, and incidentally, um, Kieran, did, Kieran and I did structurally put the, our top five. We did do it in that order. And it seems like um, it, it seems like the audience agree with the <laughs> with the order that we put in. That's, just in the interest of time, um, we did leave a little bit of time for, for Q and A, but I think we've we've, we've surpassed that time because we just hit the hour mark. What I'm going to leave is, if you do have any kind of follow up questions, um, any any comments, uh, any additional debates you want to have, please feel free to reach out to, to Kieran and I straight after the session. We've, we've put our LinkedIn details there, but please feel free to reach out to us. Um, and we really hope you found this useful, this session. Um, we try to cover as much as we can in, in an hour. Um, <laughs> please do look out for future sessions that we'll, be, that we'll be running as well. So thank you very much for your time, um, your patience with us, and also your engagement as well. So we've had some fantastic questions coming through and some, some really good debates as well. So, so thank you very much. Absolutely fantastic, folks. Thank you so much indeed for doing this. Uh, this is an amazing space to be in. Uh, again, as Faisal said, the guys are going to do more presentations. Please keep learning because you can deliver a tremendous amount with this program. Excellent. Thank you very much. Hope you all have a, have a great day. Thank you.